Shakespeare plots. Macbeth awaits. Narrated by Dr. Chaim Bernhardt. Well, hello there again. How are you, everybody? Uh, good to see you again. Uh, good Shabbos. Good Yontiv. Pontiv. Good Yontiv. Anyway, we're going to start off with uh, Macbethovitz. Macbethovitz. So, uh, let's start here. Uh, the play opens in Act 1. Uh, amid the thunder and lightning as the dry, or the three New York City list Zeugen, or which are witches, kibbutz, they talk to decide that their next meeting will be with Macbethovitz at the nearby kosher delegates. He's a general, Macbethovitz is, who suffered a severe wound in his tuchus, his backside, rendering him being a chronic pain in the... You know what? Macbethovitz reports to King Dronken of Scotland, whose longest time sober was seven days. Go figure. His general, Macbethovitz, a Meshuganah crazy from the Isle of Testicular Glands, and Banco, who is short of gelt or cash, have just defeated the Allied forces of Norway and Ireland, who were led by the traitorous putz, uh, the moron, uh, no good nick, no haired, McDumbald, and the in thane of Corda, a Meshuganah, a crazy from New York, who, New Yorker, who doesn't have a nickel or a dime in his pocket, but does have a quarter. Macbethowitz, the king's relative from the Bronx, is praised for his bravery, fighting abilities, and for his huge testicular glands. Go figure. In the following scene, Macbethowitz and Banco Kibitz they talk about their victory, the weather, the price of meatloaf, and whether or not they will be invited to Uncle Izzy's son's bar mitzvah. I hope they, they are. It would be a shame if they're not. As they wander onto a heath bar, they eat it within seconds, just before the New York City dry Zeugen, the three witches, enter and greet them with prophecies about possible shittiks or uh, matchmaking uh, situations, okay? Stating, have I got a maid, a, gr- a girl for you? Though Banco's challenges them first about their poor business success rates, they address Macbethovitz because Banco is a frugal schnorrer, he's a beggar. Okay, looking for a deal, you know, who says he doesn't have a dime to give his son for a bar mitzvah present. He should go. A quarter he has, such a big spender. They hail Macbethovitz as being insane with glands. A well-hung Meshuggah, a crazy guy, an insane of quarter in his pocket and that he will be king in the hereafter and even beyond. Macbethovitz appears to be stunned to silence, and accidentally pishes or urinates on the floor. Then Banco asks him about his future financial investments. The dry Zeugen, the three witches, respond paradoxically, saying that he will be less equipped than Macbethowitz, yet happier because his future wife won't ask her much since she suffers constantly from margin headaches. <laughs> he will be less successful, yet hornier, he will father a line of Mamzer bastard kings with other Zaftig Freud, the <laughs> buxom women, uh, though he himself will not be one. While the two men wonder about all these predictions, the Dreid Zeugen, the three witches, disappear to Yenta go talk together about whose dress will be more admired at Morty's Bar Mitzvah. This is a big deal coming up. I had probably like 500 people coming, you know, from New York. All on mass health. I mean, uh, another insane named Moss arrives in a moldy, smelly Shmata sweatshirt and informs Macbethowitz of his newly bestowed title, Insane of Corder. He is Meshugana, originally from the Bronx, and carries only quarters, never dimes or nickels. I don't know why. What do you think? The first prophecy is thus fulfilled, and Macbethowitz, previously mistrustful of the dry Zeugen, the three witches, immediately begins to fantasize about becoming Hamelech the king and having thirty vestal maidens after ingesting thirty Viagra at one time. Oh boy, he's in for a night. Hamelech drunken, the, the king drunken, who is totally get drunken, intoxicated, welcomes and praises Macbethowitz in a slobbering manner, and Banco, who is still short on cash, 
and declares that he will spend the night puking his guts out at Macbethowitz's castle while hanging upside down in a birdcage <laughs> named Inverness Nest. Benko names his Grab Schwarze, his crude grass dark son, Malcolm XXL, as his heir. Macbethowitz says, Oy vey is mir, oy my goodness and sends a message ahead to his wife, Lady Sylvia Macbethowitz, telling her about the Dreitzeugens, I don't have to tell you again, prophecies, and the fact that Hamelech, the king drunken, named his grub Schwarze son, his crude, uh, grass, uh, uh, gross, uh, dark uh, son, as his hair, not thinking at all about his other Jewish relatives. A fire should burn in his heart, God forbid. Lady Macbethowitz suffers none of her husband's uncertainties, but does suffer from constant migraine headaches, as we said, before having sex. She wishes her Macbethowitz to murder drunken in order to obtain kingship before that no good Nick, Grab Schwarzer son, steals it. Oh, when Macbethowitz arrives at Inverse Nest, Sylvia starts quetching, complaining at him for not taking his dirty shoes off at the door and for his objections to her murderous request by challenging his manhood, stating that his putz, or his phallus, is as tiny as a titmouse. Knowing this would hurt any Jewish man's esteem, she successfully persuades him to kill the king that very night at forcing him to drink ten bottles of Manischewitz wine at one sitting. Oh boy, I wouldn't want that to a lot of sugar, get diabetes from that. He and Lady Sylvia plan to get drunken, two chambermaids get drunken, get them drunk as well, so that they will black out. The next morning, they will blame the chambermaids for the murder of, and for not making any of their beds, thus getting not one tip from them. They don't deserve it. They will have no guilt to pay a decent Jewish defense lawyer and they will remember Gunish, nothing. Act 2. While Drunken is hanging upside down and completely wasted, Macbethowitz forces the ten bottles of Manischewitz wine down his throat, then stabs him with a sharpened number two pencil, despite his worrying about a pogrom, a, a disaster from the Cossacks, you know, in Russia, and a number of supernatural nightmares, including an hallucination of a large, bloody, unsharpened number two pencil. Unsharpened! He is so fablungeant, he's so lost and mixed up, that Lady Macbethowitz has to take charge, just like most Jewish wives do anyway. You know that. And in accordance with her plan, she frames Drunken's schloffen gedrunken, uh, the sleepy, drunk chambermaids. Using picture frames, she got wholesale from a local frame shop and for the murder by placing bloody number two pencils near them. She frames them. Early the next morning, Lenny Abramowitz, a bandit, Jewish-Scottish nobleman, and McDoof, a putz, uh, a, a moron, a, no New Yorker, but a loyal insane of Fife, originally from one of the five boroughs of New York City, arrive. A porter opens the gate, and Macbethowitz leads them to the king's chamber, where McDoof finds Drunken's body, but stupidly thinks McDoof is Drunken's brother-in-law, Benny Ginsburg. I don't know how he knows the difference. Macbethowitz murders the guards to prevent them from filing any life insurance claims on Drunken. But Macbethowitz claims he became angry when finding out that they were shysters. They were slime balls trying to get something for nothing. They were, dr they were shysters, drunken sons. Uh, Grab, Schwarzer, Malcolm, XXL, and Putz, Dodobrain, hop a cheap flight to England and Ireland, respectively, fearing that whoever killed Drunken desires to make a killing, killing them as well. Dorobrain suspects it was Sylvia, or some Cossack, Macbethowitz, for fakes that he is the murdered drunken's long-lost cousin from the Bronx, and assumes the throne as the new big Machamelech, the big, big, um, big, big person king of Scotland. Banco reveals this and his new low interest rates on car loans to the audience. And while suspicious of King Macbethowitz, he remembers the dried Zeugen, the, the three witches', witches prophecy about how his own descendants would inherit the throne, the furniture, the oriental rugs, and all the jewelry. Act 3. Despite his success, Macbethowitz, knowledgeable of this part of the prophecy, develops a severe case of irritable bowel syndrome. Macbethowitz invites Banco to a royal Fabregen, a, a festive gathering, Free of charge, where he discovers that Banco and his young son, Flea Bargain, will be leaving that night to visit a large discount flea market the next day. 
must be Sunday. Fearing Bankwit's suspicions, Macbethowitz arranged to have him murdered by hiring two bull vans, thick-headed oaks, from a competitive bank to kill them, later sending a third bull van uh, who made a killing selling restored toilet seats. <laughs> the assassins succeed in killing Banco when he was counting his pocket change of pennies and nickels, no quarters. But Flea Bargain escapes, hoping to catch a great deal in some rays at the nearest beach. Macbethowitz becomes... Uh, upset, but fears that his uh, his uh, his uh, phallus, Pekka, uh, I mean power, remains insecure as long long as one of Banco's Jewish relatives remain alive. Now, Modi's bar, at Modi's Bar Mitzvah, where brisket, kishka, tzimis, and mashed potatoes with garnish are being garnished, not garnish, are being served, Macbethovitz invites his lords and lady Sylvia Macbethovitz to a night of drinking a case of Manischewitz wine while dancing the horror. The Jewish dance is really dance. Banco's ghost, uh, his ghost enters and plots his falls down right on the, in front of Macbethovitz. He freaks out, stating, startling his guests to such an extent that they plots they fall right next to him on the dance floor, since the ghost, the ghost, is only visible to him. The others develop panic attacks at the sight of Macbethovitz. Vert Meshuga went with sugar crazy when he begins talking to an empty chair until a desperate Lady Sylvia Macbethovitz tells them that her husband is just upset that the Klezma band never showed up to the bar mitzvah despite their being paid well in advance. I take a, get a nice Jewish lawyer to take them a lawsuit with them. The ghost, the ghost departs and returns once again, causing Macbethovitz to slip his clothes off and dance naked to a last fast rendition of the Israeli national anthem, Hatikva. This time, Lady Sylvia tells the lords to gain a vet, go away, and they do so, wondering whether or not to contact their big macha Jewish psychiatrist to make an emergency house call. No insurance accepted. Go figure. No, no insurance. Act 4. Macbethovitz, now totally Meshuggah crazy, visits the Dry Zeugen, the three witches, once again and asks them to reveal their boobs. I mean the truth of their prophecies to him. To answer his questions, they turn to the Talmud, the, the Jewish legal interpretations, and recite certain stories, each of which offers questions to more moral questions, never answers and predictions to squelch Macbethovitz's growing paranoia and obsessive worries. First, they conjure up the cup, the head, of Albert Einstein, which tells Macbethovitz to beware of Macduff, even though he seems like he never passed kindergarten. Second, a schmendrick, or a weak person who just can't succeed, wearing bloodied garments from the kosher slaughtering of a chicken for this coming Shabbos, tells him that no one born of a woman will be able to harm Macbethovitz, only those born from a sodomized sheep. Oh. Thirdly, a crowned bellabus wearing a large chai, a, a necklace uh, that, that shows life, while holding a siddur, a prayer book, states that Macbethovitz will be safe from impregnating Sylvia, until the Great Burnham Wood Pharmacy runs out of condoms. I hope they don't. There's a big sale going on. Macbethovitz goes to the bathroom to relieve himself and to feel secure because he knows that all men are born of women, but has absolutely no idea, Gunish, health, in that how all women are born of women and that one can't have a bowel movement easily if one doesn't eat stewed prunes after being constipated. This he, he contemplates a lot. Oy. Macbethovitz also asks whether Banco's sons will ever reign in Scotland. He's become a total Meshuggah crazy now, thinking that Banco's sons can reign from the sky during Scottish thunderstorms. <laughs> the dried Zeugen, the three witches, conjure a procession, a procession of eight Yidden uh, Jewish people, competitive bankers, all similar in appearance to Banco, with the last one carrying a demand for an overdue bank loan and a magnifying glass that reflects even more Yiddish bankers, Yidden bankers, Jewish bankers, carrying overdue bank loans. Macbethovitz realizes that these are all Banco's Jewish relatives that have made killings in several other countries. After the Dreizeugen dance the horror and leave, Lenny Abramowitz enters and tells Macbethovitz that Macduff is a putz who fled to England. Macbethovitz orders that Macduff's home in Great Neck, Long Island, be seized and most cruelly sends murderous, murderers to slaughter Macduff, as well as his entire Meshbucha, his family. Although Macduff is no longer in the Great Neck home, 
Everyone there is put to death, including Lady Macduff and her young putt's son, stupid silly putt's son, Doofus. Act 5. Here we go. You excited? Meanwhile, Lady Sylvia Macbethovitz becomes filled with guilt from the crimes she and her husband have committed and starts beating her chest while davening, praying to the, the Yom Kippur Achaitz, Achaitz prayer, which is a prayer for penitence. At night, in the king's palace of Asinine, a Jewish psychiatrist and a social worker co-lead a case consultation about Lady Macbethovitz's strange habit, strange habit of shouting out a worrisome appeal to an imagined lover. Moshe, Moshe, do gain a vec? Are you going away? While she sleeps, walks. Suddenly, Lady Macbethovitz enters in a trance carrying a lit menorah, a candelabra in her hand. Crying, Oy vey is me, oh my goodness, for the murders of drunken Lady Macduff and Banco, she tries to jump into an imagined mikvah, a ritual bath, to wash off imaginary blood stains from her hands, all the while speaking in Yiddish. Dem Yiddin's simcha is mit a bissel shrek. A Jew's joy comes with a little fear about the terrible things she knows and what she pushed her husband to do. She leaves, heading straight to the shul, the synagogue, to consult with her rabbi and to begin a three-day fast to atone for her sins. The Jewish psychiatrist and social worker are shocked by Lady Macbethovitz's descent into Meshuganism, crazyism. Her belief that Gunish, nothing's going to wash away the gansa, all the blood on her hands, is an ironic reversal of her earlier claim to Macbethovitz that a little vasa, water, clears us of this deed. So long as we say a benchung, a blessing, pound our hearts, then tinkle in the toilet. In England, Macduff is informed by Ross that his castle is surprised. Wife and babes savagely slaughtered like a bunch of kosher chickens just in time for Shabbos. When the news of his mushpuch's execution reaches him, Macduff is stricken with grief, leprosy, and Bell's palsy, then vows that he's going to get even Stephen. Prince Malcolm XXL Drunken's grub, Schwarzer, son, has succeeded in raising an army and a chala with yeast in England. And Macduff joins him by sitting backwards on his horse while blindfolded, all the way to Scotland to challenge Macbethovitz and his army to a series of pinochle games. Oh boy, I hope he's got plenty of money for this. He's a gambler. The invasion has the athletic supporter of the Scottish nobles, who kachen, they, they uh, defecate, in their pants from Macbethovitz's tyrannical and murderous behavior and from his acting so much sugar, uh, uh, crazy. Grub Schwarzer, Malcolm XXL, leads an army of obese men along with Macduff and Englishman, Seward, the smelly elder, the Earl of No Dumbland, against the Meshuganum, the crazy, at Goensane Castle. While being all fired up while encamped in Burnham Woods, you get it fired up, uh, and burn the wood. The soldiers are ordered to cut down and carry tree limbs to camouflage their numbers. However, 85% of them leave abruptly to file disability claims for chronic severe back pain. <sighs> Before Macbethovitz's opponents arrive, he receives news that Lady Sylvia Macbethovitz has killed herself by fasting not just three days, but all the way from Rosh Hashanah to Pesach, Passover. This causes Macbethovitz to become so severely depressed that he over-identifies with Little Orphan Annie as he sings his Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow soliloquy. As he reflects on how short and forcocked terrible his life has been, he nevertheless awaits the English and fortifies Asinine by try tying nine asses facing backwards to a tree, the Asinine. Being grandiose, Macbethovitz believes that the dried Zeugen, they're always coming up here, the three witches, prophecies, guarantees his invincibility and that he will live longer than Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, uh, Moses, but develops panic attacks when he learns that the English army is advancing crazily on Asinine and are protected with shields of charred bark mulch from Burnham Woods. Uh, charred bark mulch, you get the Burnham Woods? A clear indication that one of the dried Zeugen's uh, predictions comes true. A battle culminates in Macduff's argument with Macbethovitz over 
who gave the largest donation to get the first aliyah that the Anna are calling up to the Torah readings during the high holiday services. Macbethowitz Vert Meshuggah, he went Meshuggah, crazy, when Macduff claims that his donation included the purchase of a new curtain for the temple ark and kills young Seward by drowning him in the seepage of 100 clogged toilets. The English forces overwhelm his army and castle with mustard farts. Macbethowitz remains grandiose by bluffing that he has no reason to fear Putz Macduff, for he can't be killed by any man born of woman, a clear indication that Macbethowitz got an F in his sex education class. Terrible, terrible. I don't know how he doesn't understand this. Macduff declares that he was born from his mother's womb. No. And is not of woman born? Hey. An example of a literary quibble and the fact that Macduff wondered if he was a non-binary transgender. This fulfilled the second prophecy. Macbethowitz realizes too late that he has forblunged the dry Sagan's words. He screwed up the, the, their words. Although he realizes that he is now totally mishugana crazy, he continues to fight Macduff, fight, and Macduff kills and beheads him, then turns his head into chopped liver, sculpture of the head of Morty, the bar mitzvah boy. The final prophecy is fulfilled. Macduff schleps, takes Macbethowitz's resculptured chopped livered head of Morty onto the stage while Grob Schwarzer, Malcolm XXL, discusses how order has been restored by demanding that everyone call in advance to order pastrami and corned beef sandwiches to avoid food lines at Morty's Bar Mitzvah. Wait, they're very cheap, they're family there. I don't know why they ought to ask the takeout. His later reference to Lady Sylvia Macbethowitz, however, reveals tis thought by self and violent hands took off her life and the rest of her clothes. But the way she killed herself is never mentioned for fear of embarrassment over what the neighbors may think. A grub Schwarzer Malcolm XXL, now the fattest king of Scotland, ever declares his wonderful intentions for the country to essen to eat on Macbethowitz's chopped liver head. Absolutely no pushing in line, please. Between the heads of Morty and Macbethowitz, there's plenty of chopped liver for everybody. And invites all to the dessert table afterwards to see him crowned at Scone by Dr. Israel Mykoff, the big Macha Jewish dentist who brought his permanent crown all the way from the Bronx just for this event. Oh, such a trip you shouldn't know from it. After watching Dr. Mykoff insert Malcolm's crown, the Gansa Meshpucha, the whole uh, family, proceed to the dessert table, which is replete with McDoof's favorite scones, rugelach, and bags of sweet touch knee, reusable one per person. A reich mensch, a real mensch, he's not.